welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. We have allowed ourselves to become so disconnected and ignorant about something that is as intimate as the food that we eat. Be prepared to grow your own for victory. I said I need somebody strong enough to clear trees and heave bales, yet gentle enough to yean lambs and wean pigs and tend the pink foam pullets who will stop his mower for an hour to splint the broken leg of a meadowlark. So God made a farmer. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast. I'm your host, Harold Thornborough, and glad you're back with us again this week. Got one more interview uh, with another homesteader today. Going to be joined by Rachel Jamison up in Michigan. She's a, I say urban homesteader, but really a suburban homesteader up there. And uh, going to hear all about the things she's doing on her homestead. And before we get into that, though, I thought I'd just let you know what we're doing around here on at the small town homestead. Um, been trying to get things ready before the snow starts flying here in a few weeks. It's coming quick, as much as I don't want to think about it. Some of you have already experienced it, and some of you never do, but that's all right. You know, we're all in our own little climates and doing our own little thing, so uh, we'll prepare for what we've got here. Um, also, I've been putting together, trying to get, taking some small steps towards putting the uh, the new uh, rabbitry and uh, quail aviary. It's really just a, it's going to be quail cages, but they're going to be rather large cages but not so tall they can fly up and hurt themselves. But I've been working on that, and I wasn't going to get any more rabbits until uh, I got that all done, but I had a couple fall into my lap here, so I went ahead and grabbed them. <laughs> and uh, so I've been trying to hurry up and get things done a little quicker than I originally thought. But hey, it's coming together real well. I can't wait to maybe do some videos on that in the future, showing you guys how that's all uh, working out. But i still got a lot of work to do on it. Um, cut down the last of the tomato plants. Gardens whew, coming to an end. we still got some leafy vegetables, but... Uh, uh, most stuff, most of the things are pretty well done. I think there's still some beets and some turnips out there, and um, I, actually, we're still getting some green beans too, which kind of surprises me. They're uh, quite full, actually. I probably need to get out there and uh, pick them. I saw them earlier, and I think I thought, wow, I better get on that. But uh, yeah, still a lot going on, and I still haven't been managing to get in the woods to do some hunting again this weekend. But uh, hopefully soon. I I keep thinking. I I guess I'm going to be hunting with the gun this year. I've been trying to just do archery. But uh, I'm probably going to want to get some meat, so I'm probably going to go out with the gun and increase my chances a little bit when when that gets full-blown full, full blown here pretty soon. I guess that's enough of all that stuff. Uh, let's just go ahead and head on over to the, the chat I had with uh, Rachel. On today's podcast, I'm joined by Rachel Jamison. Rachel is an urban homesteader in Michigan who, from what I can tell uh, from her posts on Facebook, is taking some great steps towards self-sufficiency uh, right where she is. Uh, welcome to the Modern Homesteading Podcast, Rachel. Hi. Thank you for having me. That's great to have you on here. Um, could you just take a couple minutes and just tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got, in, how you got started in homesteading? Yeah, I've been thinking about this, and I guess um, – before I became a stay-at-home mom, I taught preschool for three years, and then I um, became a mother, and it wrecked my world. <laughs> mm. And now I um, I have been a stay-at-home homeschool mom for let me see, nineteen years. And but we have three children, three girls. Mm -hmm. Our oldest is adopted. She is 26. We adopted her when she was 16. Mm. And um, and then we have a 19 and a 16-year-old. And we will be graduating our youngest this coming spring. And my whole life will change again. Yeah. But um, I, I do some, you know, some online work for a small homeschool company, some shipping and receiving and billing. And, and that's kind of what I do just to mm -hmm. make uh, a little extra money. But we started homesteading. I, I don't even really know when we actually started what I guess people would call homesteading, mm -hmm. but it started with um, some free tomato plants <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't know where to stick them because we had, you know, all green one. And so I kind of stuck them in one of our ornamental beds and, um, I pushed wheelbarrows full of tomatoes through the neighborhood after that, <laughs> trying to give them away because I didn't know how to can and I didn't know what to do with them. And all we knew what to do was slice them and put them on our plate at dinner. And um, that what? was mm, that what? was about 16 years ago. What made you want to grow them? Did you just just for a hobby, or did you was you just thinking about healthy eating at that point? Or at that point, I I've always been 
health conscious, um, you know, but not to the point where I am now. What, how we really probably got into the, like, the major home study we do now, because basically mm-hmm. if it doesn't come out of my kitchen, we don't eat it at this point. Um, so I cook three meals a day, 365 days a year, mm-hmm. and we never eat out. And it came about with a health crisis. Mm. Um, when I was 26, I was so sick I couldn't climb a flight of stairs, and I was accumulating um, massive amounts of doctor bills, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Mm. And um, I just started reading and reading and reading, and I was diagnosed with celiac disease, which means I can't have gluten. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I continued to collect diagnoses, and the gluten-free diet didn't work for me. And so I just really started concentrating after reading a lot on organic food and nutrient-dense food. And now, today, I garden and walk, and I use no-till method, which is uh, pretty laborsome. Mm-hmm. And um, I am vibrant and healthy, and... And then four years ago, well, no, probably about six years ago, my our middle daughter started having her own health crisis. And so it just really, that was when we stopped eating anything from the grocery store for mm. the most part. Because she ended up having not only celiac disease, but a heart problem and some other, and GERD and migraines. And I mean, she was 14. It was just heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. But now through food... Now through food and good nutrition and healthy food, she is a vibrant full-time college student putting herself through school working part-time. Wow. And um, she was incredibly ill. So it's um, to me, for us, homesteading is about being thrifty, but uh, just about feeding our bodies. Yeah, yeah. Good food. Well, I can definitely relate to that. That's that's real similar to my situation in some ways, you know, that food was kind of, killing me too you know just the food i was eating and you know that's what really turned me around as well so uh, yeah i think a lot of people are yeah. waking up to um a homesteading lifestyle and growing healthy food just because of the health crisis absolutely i mean this is a theme that <laughs> i've done a few of these interviews with some other homesteaders in uh, the last few days and i'll tell you that that's been the theme that's what has gotten almost everybody into it uh has been uh, food uh, problems yeah, it's it's amazing when you delve into it how we're just not feeding our bodies with, you know, fast food, whether it's a box from the grocery store or a drive through mm-hmm. We're just not feeding our bodies. And even the food in the grocery stores, you know, organic, Joel talked about, Joel Fallatin talked mm-hmm. about better than organic. And, you know, I could, it'd probably be cheaper, maybe not cheaper, but definitely less effort for me to go down and buy organic produce. Yeah. And I do buy some because we only live, we live on a third of an acre. Mm-hmm. And um, I do buy some, but I buy it from a local farmer who I basically interviewed. The poor man probably thought I was crazy. <laughs> but um, I interviewed him and talked to him for a long time about his growing up practices. But, you know, you can go and get organic food, but it doesn't always mean it's nutrient dense. Mm-hmm. So we didn't want just the absence of chemicals. We wanted it. We wanted food that had as much nutrition in it as yeah. possible. Yeah, I've I've noticed that. You know, a lot of people talk about you know going on diets and losing weight, and 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 you can, I, from what I witness, you can be uh, you can be eating a ton of food and and really be way overweight and it be getting tons of calories, but actually being starving to starving to death uh, for nutrients in your body. Oh yeah, I mean it's I'm it's an epidemic. Yeah, and and uh, that a lot of our health issues in America are directly related to the food that we eat. Yeah, but you back to my homestead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, and you don't really hear about that in the media. All they want to talk about is obesity being the problem and this and that, but it it really does come down to the nutrients in the food. I think. I mean, it's what I what I see anyway. Oh, it does, and I, I you know I. I don't know. Joel talks, you know, I've read a lot of his books and I've read, um, you know, I've read Elliot Coleman's books mm-hmm. and, but there's a local guy, you know, that you can't find him on the internet. He's Amish, mm-hmm. but I took a great deal of his classes and his whole focus was on growing nutrient dense food and, you know, sending it into labs. He sends it into labs and gets it tested. Mm-hmm. And proves that his 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 food is nutrient dense, and then he teaches classes on um, soil 
and how to improve your soil. And he's actually yep. friends with oh. Elliot and John Jevens and um, Joel. Okay. Yeah, I was getting ready and, to say um, that it really does come down to the soil. I mean, that's where your plants are getting yeah. the, their nutrients from. So healthy soil is where it all begins for sure. Yeah, and and there's such a relationship. I was my friend that's a doctor also is a gardener, and um, there's such a a correspondence there between gut health and soil health, and mm-hmm. how they both have all this whole, you know, the microbes and the mm-hmm. mycelium, and just it's just amazing. And I think we know so little about how it really works <laughs> that um. We we kind of know what we're supposed to do, but we just want to take the easy way out and go through the drive through right? <laughs> oh, and it is easy, and we're all so busy. And I would have mm-hmm. to say for us, that is the hardest part about homesteading. I was trying to think about the hardest things for me about homesteading urban. Mm-hmm. And when I say urban, I, I guess a lot size would be urban. Technically, would probably be considered suburban. Mm-hmm. And um, our area is actually considered rural, even though we're the biggest town in this northern Michigan, um, but I have a third of an acre, and I have restrictions like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, a third of an <laughs> so acre is quite a bit of land, chickens, for sure. It is, and you know what I've found? If you intensively um, garden it, it will wear you out. Uh-huh. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a lot to work out. with. Yeah, for sure. It, it is, and um, at first I was disappointed that we didn't have enough, and, and now the only reason we would like to move is our area is quite expensive to live in, and, and we want to move and get out of debt. Well, and you, and you just said there's a lot of restrictions, too, though, right? Yes, and yeah. we would like to have a few more animals. I would like to have meat birds. Right now what I do is I, I buy my chicken from friends, and I buy pork and beef from local farmers. Mm-hmm. I buy my extra vegetables from local farmers, and... Um, my husband, we all, actually all of us hunt and fish. And um, Yeah, I've seen the pictures of I've you helped. just canning an entire deer <laughs> recently. <laughs> yeah, we just I just canned 70 pounds of um, wow. venison and, oh, uh, I don't know, four gallons of lard. and But, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's like my whole life, and we, we butcher the deer ourselves. Mm-hmm. By the time you pay for it to have somebody do it, it just, you might as well just go and buy meat. Yeah. So, um, we learned to butcher it ourselves. My daughter, our youngest daughter, actually worked on a hog farm, and I went down there and um, learned how to harvest a hog and make charcuterie last year. Okay, I don't know that what that is. What is class. that? It's um, traditionally cured meat. Okay, okay. So we learned how to make copal, cop. Bella, I never can say these names correctly, but <laughs> in prosciutto, prosciutto. Oh, and, okay, yeah. Um sausages like the traditional way with with just salt curing and and um it was just fascinating There's yeah that's a, science behind that's a it, wonderful but. skill to have right there yeah yeah so i went down and then my christmas gift for my kids was the, you know there's a book called it's just called charcuterie <laughs> so um i've tried my hand at pepperoni and it tasted terrible <laughs> <laughs> but i'm sure i did something wrong but um yeah so on our third acre we have um let me see. We have a 40 by 50 garden that I grow intensively. So my husband's kind of a jack of all trades. He can do anything. So I dream that he does it. <laughs> so he built me these metal trellises out of metal conduit. Okay. And so he bent them and we used re-rod to get them to stay in the ground. And so he bent those and um, I put squash up those and tomatoes up those. If I can get it to climb it. That's what I do. Yeah, vertical gardening is when and, you're limited on space. That's a good way to go, isn't it? Yeah, that's that's what I do. And then we have um, four fruit trees. Um, we have three apple. We had five. We lost last well, two winters ago. We had a. It is not, I don't ever remember getting in this cold, but we had negative thirty eight for two or three weeks in a row. Mm-hmm. And so we lost our nectarine. One of our nectarine trees. So. We have a nectarine tree, and um, they're dwarfed, and then we have four chickens, and they are my garden helpers <laughs> and tenderers because they ate all my greens. So today we had to fence in the greens because they just devoured my, my kale and my chard because oh. they're little houdinis. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that's what I, you know, and then we, we when we moved into our house, we put in a um, wood-burning furnace. 
So mm-hmm. it's in the house and it blows through our air ducts. And we do everything probably that a homesteader does. We just don't have as many animals and we don't have as much property. Yeah, it sounds like you're in a lot of the, the same boat I'm in as far as uh, limited on space and trying to do all you can. But I find that there there's things there's a lot of things I'm still not doing yet on my property as limited as I am. I mean, people talk about <laughs> homesteading 100 acres or something, and I, I I can't even imagine that because I stay really busy just trying to handle what I got, you know, and just a little bit of space and think about all the things yeah. I I should be doing that I haven't done yet. That you could do and i i almost take it like a challenge sometimes just to see what i can do you know it's like how much can you do in a in a city lot you know yeah. it's fascinating to me yeah to and do i that. i love like the the challenge of um how else can i save money or how can i not mm-hmm. buy something so right now my new challenge is this winter to learn about mealworms so i can give my chickens a protein source mm-hmm. and so i'd like to grow mealworms right now i ferment their feed and we okay. grow sprouts for them in the winter because we get feet upon feet of snow. So the chickens will get no greens unless I make it for them. And we yeah. buy their grain from a local granary. So it's non-GMO, organic, and it has no soy in it. What uh, what seed are you using? Or what are you I'm sprouting? Sorry, what, my, yeah, what are you sprouting? We are sprouting um, sunflower seeds. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Black-seeded sunflower seeds, yeah. and they... They love them. They yeah. get all excited. And then that for rabbits. <laughs> and we take them out there. The boss, yeah. We've done that for the rabbits. That and we even well. eat them. Yeah. The yeah, sprouts, we eat them. They yeah. taste like, yeah, they're pretty good. So, uh-huh. yeah, so that's what I do. And, and I think, you know, they really seem to enjoy the, the fermented feed, especially in the winter. It comes out there, and it's, it's room temperature. But, you know, when it's, you know, zero degrees outside, mm-hmm. they they love that, getting that, you know, 65-degree <laughs> sprouted, soaked meal so <laughs> warm them up yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and they're not real fond of the snow we have the only way we can get them seem to be able to get them to go out in the snow is um because we can only have them in the garden we're not allowed to have them free range mm-hmm. so um and our garden we fenced our garden and so they could go out so in the winter they get to go out there but they don't because they don't like the snow <laughs> <laughs> but they're very little spoiled girls they definitely are and yeah. um it won't bother me to butcher them because I know it's part of the process, but it will because we've actually kind of formed this little relationship with them and they're a lot cuter than I ever thought they would be. Yeah, I'm sure you'll do what's necessary, but it's, it's, yeah, it's hard. I, I've been like that yeah. with animals several times, and it gets tougher. And you know what? I think the, sometimes I think the more I do it, the harder it gets instead of easier. I, I maybe sound strange, but you just, I don't know, maybe as I get older, I get a little softer on that. And I just have a harder time doing it. I mean, I do it, but, you know, it's it's it gets harder all the time, I think. Yeah, it does. Well, I, I you know, and I'm kind of where Joel is, where um, he talked about how if he – you know, if, it, if it's not hard, there's something wrong. Yep, you know, you're taking a life, even if it is an animal life. So, yeah. you know, I try to think that this is this is a good thing that it bothers me. Yeah. You know, some, if it didn't bother me, there'd probably be something wrong. Just just had that conversation so, with somebody else earlier, and yeah, it's, it's yeah. exactly right. It should bother you some, and and you know what? There's a level of appreciation that when folks do that, there's a level there's a level of appreciation for that animal that people who buy their meat at the grocery store will never have. I don't believe. Right. And, you know, it amazes me the people that um, they just don't even comprehend, mm-hmm. you know, where their meat comes from or or they have a hard time. They would have a hard time eating the chicken if they knew that it was, you know, mm-hmm. walking outside my front door. But they'd go to the store and go buy it and eat it. Yeah. And they know and, it. They just turn a blind eye to it and they try not to think about it, I think. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, I have a few friends that, that are vegans and, and it bothers them. Um, one of the things that I try to reiterate to my friends that are vegans and vegetarians is that, you know, we, we actually respect the animal because it had a really good life up until that last five seconds. And, um, and we use all of it. You know, I compost my, I compost the feathers. We actually, we, I don't know, like a Western price style paleo diet. Mm -hmm. That's what works best for my daughter and I, um, my husband and other daughter eat bread <laughs> but we can't mm-hmm. but you know we eat the liver we eat the heart we eat we actually i think i might be the only one that asks for the kidneys and 
<laughs> stuff when we get our meat back from the butcher. But but we actually eat all that, and um and um, we boil the feet and make now wonderful I'm broth. Say, I bet those feet go in broth. <laughs> yeah, I knew. Yep, it. yep. And I may have been the only person that asked for a pig head from one of my friends too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know that used to be a pretty common thing. I mean, to to, to make things from the head. Yeah. Yeah, my husband grew up on head cheese. His uh-huh. grandmother used to make it. Yeah, yeah. And um and you know they actually. I'm sure you can find somebody that says it's bad for you, but there's a lot of people out there that think it's good for you. And I can tell you how much more vibrant my daughter and I are. And I was actually also diagnosed with fibromyalgia and Mm. starting to eat like this. I have no pain. Wow. And so um, for me, the proof is in the pudding. And it works for me. Everybody's body chemistry is different, but this is what works for us. Yeah. So, And I feel like it's, treating the animals with respect when we consume everything rather than wasting mm-hmm. it. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Well, yeah. well, well, tell me a little bit about your garden. What kind of things are you growing? You pretty much just grow everything or, or what are you doing? Well, I have in the garden, we have, um, this year my chickens grew. <laughs> um, they, they planted some things for me. I, I, I don't have a lot of room, so I wasn't going to plant squash this year. But my chickens planted squash for me, and I'm trying to remember, it was buttercup. They planted buttercup squash Mm -hmm. for me. I'm not exactly sure how. I mean, I threw them probably scraps, and then either they ate it and pooped it out or it got just left. They scattered it. But I ended up with like 30 Hubbard. I had. Or not Hubbard. The butternut. Of the squash. And yeah, and I'm like, I'm at a loss. I was, that was like, I'm scooting them around the neighborhood in the wheelbarrow because <laughs> I don't, <laughs> we will never eat that many. Our, uh, our entire that, front porch is decorated right now with pumpkins that my rabbits planted because I did the same thing with them. I threw them <laughs> last year's, uh, you know, pumpkins around Halloween. Everybody's, you know, has pumpkins and we just tossed them out there and let the rabbits munch on them and they were scattering them around and <laughs> planted them. And yeah. I had, and I had pumpkins everywhere and our whole, they're all over our front porch right now. <laughs> I love that. And that's one of the things that I've learned throughout the years is if it volunteers itself, it seems like almost always that is the most resilient plant. Yeah. So I've learned to just leave the volunteers and let them, let them make their way in. Let me tell you, these, these little squash were amazing. Mm. So I have that and we have, um, I plant purple beans. Um, part of the reason I plant purple beans is because we're lazy and I can see them and they're easy to pick. <laughs> And I grow those on trellises. Um, we grow tomatoes and potatoes, and um, I don't grow any grains. We tried corn, but it just it takes up quite a bit of space yeah, in the I, garden for that's us. That's not my experience too. It's just it's not a good crop for urban homesteading or suburban homesteading. It takes a lot of room to get a good yield out of it. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I and then I have um, I tomato tomatoes because mm-hmm. we like green salsa, so I can those. And I grow onions and garlic and. Zucchini, every year it kind of varies. I grew garden huckleberries one year, hmm. and those, I got those from um, Baker Creek. Yeah, I've never even heard of those. Heirloom, and um, those things were so prolific, it was unbelievable. Well, what kind of <laughs> taste do they I have? Are they like something sweet, or what are they? Not, the, not really. They are, they are, um, what is, they're kind of, they're part of the solstice family, so they have to be cooked. Oh, okay. And definitely sweetened. Okay. But they freeze really well, so we froze tons of them. And um, but they took kind of a long time. They wanted hot. They wanted more heat, I think, mm-hmm. than what we had. And yeah. I've tried Brussels sprouts. Those didn't work. I've had a lot of things oh, that yeah. I've tried and failed. This year, my garden wasn't. This year, I've been just so busy that we, my garden got kind of neglected. But I have. We have rhubarb. Mm-hmm. We have some perennials, so we yeah. have rhubarb, and I started come free from seed, which was kind of a nightmare, but I did end up with three plants and now they're growing like gangbusters. And this was the first year I did, um, compost tea with them. Mm, yeah. And, um, I made compost tea with come free. And then what else do we have? We have rhubarb. I have blackberry, thornless blackberries and raspberries. Yeah, and some I have Jerusalem some artichokes. I know. Cause we've had that discussion before. <laughs> Yes, yes. And we still, which is highly unusual, last year we had about a foot of snow by now. This mm. year it is still 58 degrees here, which is oh, wow. just unheard of. So I still haven't gotten the frost to 
to harvest those like yeah. you'd suggested. Yeah, they taste so, a lot better after a frost, yeah. Yeah, and now I'm getting a little concerned because where it plant them seems, you know, it's, it's technically contained, but I'm getting a little nervous because my husband is not really excited about them getting into the, <laughs> in, Start, into other things. Starting yeah. to run a little bit, yeah. Yeah, they are, uh, they yeah. do take over. <laughs> they are something else. Yeah, and they're in a big raised bed, but I'm still concerned because I had, I had, um, government in a raised bed and well it, it's found its way everywhere <laughs> you have the, but, um, the artichokes in a raised bed they're not well we have a retaining wall mm. for our basement and it's a big huge planter that's part of retaining wall and the oh there is only one side that it could kind of creep out of and there is timbers there but mm. the timbers have started to deteriorate and i'm getting a little nervous that they might yeah you know creep their way out once I harvest these, I gotta figure out how to eat them because this is this will be the first year that I've ever um, actually harvested them. I started with one mm. little rhizome and I've just kind of let them grow, and so this will be the first year. And um, I might try fermenting them because I heard it helps with the gassy effect. Yeah, that's what I hear <laughs> too, and uh, yeah, that is a problem. So <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a potato. That's what I mean, I've, me, they're just a potato substitute for about anything potato. I mean, you can just do about anything you can do with a potato with them, pretty much. Yeah, and I've heard, you know, and they're lower glycemic, and um, mm-hmm. so I was, you know, kind of excited about that. And I, I'm not excited about anything that doesn't involve work for me <laughs> to do. So I know that when we move, because our plans are to move in a couple of years, um, we will be planning a lot of perennial yeah. items. Yeah. So well, that I've, I've heard you discuss a little less the work. permaculture a time or two. I think you're kind of, that might be something that you're interested yeah. in. Yeah. Just... I'm learning more and more about it. Um my garden, you know, when I think that with my garden, the more I let it go and be relaxed about it, which is really hard because I like neat, orderly rows, mm-hmm. and the better my garden is done. We started, we live in Michigan, so basically, unless you're you're downstate, they have some real nice farmland, but up here, we have sand. It's, it's beach sand, and we live mm-hmm. on a small lake. I don't know if you saw some of the pictures, yeah. but we live on a small 20-acre lake, and um. So we have beach sand, and I started with sand that, I mean, I had to water every day, and that yeah. was horrible, and now I have really nice black black soil. And, you um, get that from just putting down lots of mulch and things like that? Or? I have been, we've added um, manure and alpaca, mm-hmm. what do they call those, beans? I can't remember what they call it, alpaca yeah. manure, but um, we've added alpaca manure and rabbit manure, and we've added regular you know cow manure mm-hmm. i've added straw and we've every fall i try to do a green manure so um last year i did clover this yeah. year i'm running behind and i haven't bought anything yet your comfrey uh, is probably playing a big part in it this year huh yeah and i and i of course the chickens eat some of that too but mm-hmm. i try not to give them too much of yeah. it but so I've added um, all sorts of organic matter. We put all of our leaves in there. We mulch them and put all of, try to put all those in there. Now that our dogs passed this summer, and it was such a sad thing, but um, one of the things that's not sad is we don't have the bombs in the yard. So <laughs> for the first year, I'll be able to actually mow them up, and hopefully that will mulch the leaves enough to put them in the garden mm-hmm. instead of getting dog poop in there with it. So Yeah, yeah. This will be the first year we'll actually put leaves in there from our own yard. We've gotten them from other people's yards and shredded them, but the shredder died and we're too thrifty to buy a new one. So just through all of that and the compost, and then we have added some green sand and some rock dust. And I'm not real scientific about it, and I probably should be more scientific about it. But there's so much to understand about soil that Mm -hmm. it's... It overwhelms me, and I've had to put my eggs into the house basket because of our health crisis. So I haven't studied as much on um, the soil as I as I probably should. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've um, done a pretty good job with it. I mean, you've turned it into some, it sounds like some black gold, actually, you know, as far as uh, what you're growing in. I know. I wish I could take it with me when we moved because I'm going to have to start <laughs> you, over. You, you probably could, but you're going to make somebody angry, probably. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, um, I don't know, you know, it's like one of those things, will it be something somebody wants, or are they going to go, oh, somebody, like, I just want grass there, because when we bought the house, it was, you know, just a chem lawn, yeah. and that's what the majority of people have have up here, 
is is chemlons and yeah. Um, so that's that's just been a challenge. Is one of the things too that's been a challenge as a home urban homesteader is everybody thinks that you have all this time because you live in town, mm-hmm. and um, friends don't understand and family don't understand that you're busy because I'm canning today. You yeah. Know? Why can't you? Why can't you come over and do this with me? And this been kind of. A sore subject a few times. <laughs> yeah, food, fruit, food preservation and food preparation can take up a lot of time. I have definitely found that out. I mean, I, I spend way more time in the kitchen doing things than I do out in the garden doing the things I want to do. <laughs> yeah, I know. If I could just get a chef. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the good thing is, is I do, you know, I've had quite a few friends that, you know, lately my heart has always been to share my knowledge with people. And mm-hmm. so... Um, I've had quite a few friends come over and, and learn to can and learn to garden or awesome. learn to butcher. And so that's kind of, I think, where our future farm, when we actually get our farm, will be is not so much in um, making money selling products, but actually teaching. Mm-hmm. And my hope is actually not to really make money teaching other than just cover costs. Yeah. With, to actually help help single and young moms because it seems like there's just I learned nothing and my parents grew absolutely nothing we had um, we didn't even have grass it wasn't important and my mom worked and my dad worked and you know we just kind of ate out of a box and so mm-hmm. I've learned all this these skills on my own and some from my mother-in-law and it seems like there's just kind of this revival of, of people wanting to do this Mm-hmm. And I just really want to help moms feed their kids healthy food. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I th- and, and you know, there's a, there's a big need for that too. I mean, there's just so many people out there wondering how do you do this, and and uh, yeah, to be able to uh, get with somebody local. And there's there's lots of ways online to learn and through e courses and you know, even extension offices and things like that. But if you've got a friend that can that can teach you, I mean, that's a real blessing. And there's nothing like hands on experience and having somebody you can just go to with questions. And I think that's awesome that you're willing to do that and wanting to do that. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and for me, um, you know, I'm a Christian, and so for me, my faith plays a big role in it. So for mm-hmm. me, I want it to be a ministry. I want to help some woman that, you know, maybe she's on she's on food stamps and, and can't afford a lot, but she can buy a thirty, you know, a dollar packet of seeds and grow a yeah. tomato in a pot. And so I'd like to help, you know, those moms, you know, just learn how to how to do some of this, save money, and feed their kids healthy food, and avoid all of the health issues that come with that because I think it's just it's an epidemic and I don't think it's going to get any better unless we change people's view on food I agree I agree and and it is it's a real crisis and and, and it's not getting any better it's it's actually just getting worse and worse but the good news is that you know it's actually got to a point where there's so many people waking up to it I mean because they look at uh, just the way they feel and they're looking at rising medical expenses and then everybody has somebody in their family or has a close friend or someone who has cancer or some really debilitating uh, problem. And, you know, it's just people are saying there's a real problem here because this wasn't like this 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you know, and um, it's just getting yeah. worse and people are waking up to it. And and I think what you're wanting to do there, um, there's going to be a real need for that because I think as time goes here in, in the next few years, there's going to be a lot of people looking for help and looking for answers on how to how to mm-hmm. feed their family in a better way for sure and and healthier. Yeah, and you know my dad my dad died when I was 24 of cancer mm. and my aunt died my dad was 44 years old and my aunt died when she was 44 years old of cancer. Mm. My dad's form of cancer I'm not sure you know was probably not related to his eating but my aunt's form of cancer was she had colorectal cancer and mm-hmm. she was she was obese and she ate she ate um horrible food and Yeah. Um, that's one of the forms of cancer that they say is something you can, you know, you can avoid with, with eating well. Yeah. Eating well. And heart disease. And, you know, our three main causes of, of death, I think now went from being, you know, illnesses to like all food related diseases, heart disease, cancer. And I can't remember what the other one was, but you know, it's just something has to change. And, you know, as a country and as a people, we can't continue to have increasing medical costs. 
So yeah, the uh, the type yeah. type two diabetic is is you know that's a lot of food related yeah. problems there too. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, and and, and it's not something unfortunately that um, gets talked about a lot. You know, it's just let's give you the medication and mm-hmm. um, and let's not change. You know, and, and then they don't talk a whole lot about changing your diet and right. It, it's just I find I find it really sad. I'm not against medical treatment. You know, I, yeah. I had a discussion with my own mom. You know, you need to go in and get medication and put out the fire and then change your diet. But right now we need to put the fire out because our blood pressure's been high. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I said, you know, you need to get this. You need to put the fire out. You know, with the medication and then let's, let's work on changing your diet. But it is it's a um, it's an epidemic and. I hope to help people change their change their lives and and you know the thing is, is it's been so good for my kids. It's not just about the food, not just because of the food, but my kids have skills mm-hmm. and discipline because you know they have chores and somebody has to go let the chickens out in the morning. It doesn't matter if it's twenty four below. And somebody has to go and do the frozen water, and somebody has to hoe the garden, even if it's 90 degrees outside. Of course, when it's 24 below, and, they, they probably don't want to come out anyway. <laughs> yeah, most of the time they don't. <laughs> but actually, you know, those little chickens were quite, they were pretty resilient through that. Yeah. And um, I couldn't believe it. But, you know, and, and with the cooking, you know, somebody's got to cook dinner. Somebody's got to ferment the chicken feed. Somebody's got to make the mm-hmm. sauerkraut. Somebody's got to can. And my girls know how to, you know, they know how to can. They have skills that I didn't and yeah, that's awesome. um, I don't know you know how much they'll do because at this point they're pretty sick of it <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll you know? appreciate it later for sure I mean you know it's a, but that's they, the thing everybody always kind of resents those things when they're in the midst of it but then they get away from it for a couple of years and it's like wait a minute <laughs> they'll see the problems too yeah my girls actually always say mom um, you know when once you know once in a while when we eat something somewhere else and you know, somebody, not that friends made it or anything, but like just store bought stuff. We like hummus or something. And they're like, mom, your hummus is so much better. Why is it so much better? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, they're just so used to homemade food that yeah. they're just like, you know, homemade it's food. And Funny how your taste buds always kind of adjust to that. And it actually just tastes, uh, you, I mean, for me, for one thing, it's like to eat a tomato out of the store. I, I can't even hardly uh, bear it. It doesn't even taste like a tomato to me. It just tastes so blah and bland and yucky. I don't. I can't even stand yeah. it. You know, it's just uh, food don't taste the same for sure. Yeah, our fruit trees are only three years old, and I had never had. You know, locally we have a lot of apples, and um, so I've always had you know good apples from local places, but we'd never had like nectarines in our nectarine tree. Literally, I, I couldn't have gotten a picture because it was the four of us, but we stood around the, the nectarine tree, all of us eating a nectarine, and all of us, you know, going, mmm, mmm. <laughs> I mean, it was so good and yeah. so sweet, and we were just like, who needs candy when you have this? I no just kidding. had never tasted a nectarine right off the tree. It was yeah. fantastic. That's how I feel about, so. like, all the uh, berry bushes around my place. You know, I got raspberries and blackberries and blueberries, and I walk down there, and it's like a candy factory. You know, you can just walk around out there and just eat eat all the time. Yeah. Well, and then, and then we use, um, you know, we make our own, most of our own soaps and cleaners mm-hmm. and, and stuff too. So, you know, we've just gotten so used to this lifestyle and the schedule and I just can't, some of me sometimes envies the free time that other people have. So, you know, <laughs> homesteaders don't always think their life yeah. is amusing. Once in a while we get pretty tired of the drudgery. <laughs> yeah. Like when I run out of laundry soap and I've got three loads of laundry and I'm like, oh, now I gotta go yeah. make some. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I know that. I know how that feels. You're tired, uh, especially for it's me. It's so much I, easier to go down. Yeah. And buy it. <laughs> you get, especially if you're working. I mean, I, you, you're stay home mom, and I mean, there's a lot to do there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, you know, working a full day too, coming home and and having to do those things. Sometimes I just don't feel like doing it, you know. And my wife oh, works uh, also full time, so yeah, it gets it gets a little hectic sometimes around here. But our kids are grown up and moved out now, so we don't, you know, that's a little easier, and it's just us, so it ain't like we have to, you know, take care of kids and things now. Yeah, I think I'm I'm looking forward to that. Not that I want my kids to leave because I really mm. enjoy them and they're great kids. And then in other ways, we're kind of dreading it because we're like, um, oh, that's 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 four extra hands for canning. That's, yeah. that's extra butchers. I mean, how are we do this? But then we'll have less mouths to feed. So I suppose we won't have to put quite as much away. So to, <laughs> yeah, and we, we're so used to having the, their help and. You know, I count on them a lot, and I forget how much I count on them, you know. I don't know, though. I mean, mine aren't here to uh, help do it, 
but they sure show up to grab jars of this and that when they get hungry, like some pickles or some salsa or some jellies or something like that. They're like, oh, it just tastes so much better than the stuff in the store. So I see my stuff just disappearing all the time. But that's okay. At least I know they're eating a little healthier, you know. I have a feeling that will happen because we've started collecting (laughs) other people's children. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) My friend's kids are all like, oh, Mrs. Mrs. Jameson made, she had what for dinner at work? You know, they suddenly show up at the door. That's our favorite soup that Mrs. Jameson made. Is, is did you guys make extra? And yeah. So, and my daughter has a, a really late, oh, terribly late class. And um, the way she bribed her friends to drive her home that on those nights is that the next morning her mom, I would make breakfast <laughs> mm. with real eggs and real bacon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. It's funny, but you know that's, that's great of, though. Yeah, it's it's a blessing though that you can is. pass that on, and, and it, that too I think helps wake people up to you know to to that. I mean, it's not all about just health. It's it it is somewhat about taste as well. I mean, people people eat that kind of food and they go, "Wow, how can I do this? Because I want this," you know, and uh, that that helps to open up yeah. some eyes as well. I think. Yeah, my daughter is allergic to eggs, but we have chicken eggs, cooked, but we can't have duck. So mm-hmm. real figure that's one of the ones. That's one of our crazy rules. And um, but um, to us, the I had never tasted the difference between just store eggs and, and homegrown mm-hmm. eggs. It's just it's amazing. I don't even yeah. want a store egg anymore. Yeah, I mean, you those uh, pale, pale yolks and yeah, no taste. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, we just won't even use them. I mean, if, if our chickens don't lay, we just don't even eat eggs because mm-hmm. it's just like, eh. yeah. So it well, definitely changes your life. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. So, Home you, setting does, so yeah. you're 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 seeking to find a bigger piece of property and move off of there soon uh, and expand. I mean, what's your plans for uh, for what you're wanting to do? Uh, more life. Well, our but. plans are um, we would like to move out of the area a little bit. I mean, we're my husband still has a he has a good job, so he's still going to mm-hmm. be driving into town to work and. Um, pay off debt we the only you know we're big into being debt free mm-hmm. and so um you know we owe for our house but you know so we want to sell our house and move out of town and we wouldn't we're hoping to be able to afford 10 acres the air the market here is quite expensive mm-hmm. so 10 acres we'd like more but we it's probably realistically about what we'll get but you know if we can have other animals that's our biggest issue is finding out where the zoning is yeah. allows that because our zoning is quite restrictive. I know a lot of states, their zoning isn't, but you basically have to be zoned, zoned agriculture to have any livestock yeah. other than chickens. Wow. So that is going to be our, our biggest issue, finding that. And then my hope is to get the get the garden going again and, and have meat chickens and egg layers and probably, I don't think I want to get a milk cow. It's just I have a friend with one, and the commitment is, is just massive. Yeah. And my husband is not real fond of winter, so he'd like to go away a little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we might get some goats. We'll see. It depends on how close the kids stick around once they have kids. Our oldest is does not live in the area, so we can't really expect her to help. Mm-hmm. And then, um, but probably right away after we start moving, I'll start having classes at my house. I actually already do have some classes here and there. Yeah. Um, but with homeschooling, my youngest who graduates, it's, it, you know, that's kind of my focus this year. And then um, I'll be doing some canning classes and mm-hmm. and stuff. But I really want to use, use the land to help people. And that that's just kind of been my heart is to help young moms and people and so that that is our goal, and mm-hmm. my husband hopes to hunt and fish more, I believe. <laughs> yes, I, I have that same hope, but it just doesn't seem to be working out for me very well. <laughs> I, I've been out yeah, like four know. times so far this season, and it's not, not been good, but... <laughs> oh, well, I, I take oh, what I yeah. get, and, you know, if, if, if I'm meant to get one, I guess I'll get one. Yeah, we got one, but... Yeah. And I haven't been out yet this year at all. It, I've, I've just been too busy, and I think it's kind of disappointing my husband, because... We do actually enjoy sitting there in the blind, you know, mm. next to each other because we're not allowed to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and and even reading a book is frowned upon, but <laughs> because, you know, the papers can make noise. But yeah. um, I do enjoy sitting there, just sitting there. Sometimes it's yeah. the first 20 minutes, you have a hard time getting yourself to calm down. And then after that, 
it's just really relaxing and so I like getting up in a tree stand I, myself. It's just so peaceful and quiet yeah. up in a tree stand and looking down and, and getting a good eye on everything and it just it relaxes me and I, I really enjoy yeah. that. That's a, just just to sit there and just check out nature and watch the squirrels run around and, and you know, just that if I never even see a deer, it's I never consider it a wasted hunt. I just have a good time just sitting out there. Yeah, and I think that's where my husband goes. It's just such a it brings the stress level down mm-hmm. to, you know, livable but so i haven't even had a chance to which i'm pretty bummed about our girls both used to hunt but um you know they're just so busy right now with school it's such a busy time in their lives so yeah yeah. but um and fishing i don't mind fishing but i don't like trolling up here we have big lakes and so people Mm. troll for salmon yeah and um white fish and i get seasick (laughs) so you you like to fish from the bank is what you're saying (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And my husband loves trolling. So, <laughs> um, so I don't go fishing a whole lot, but I love smoke. I we we smoke the fish when we get in, and, and mm-hmm. I love that part. The yeah. smoked fish is a lot of meat. Yeah, you eat a lot of meat with fish. Well, and salmon get pretty big. I mean, they mm-hmm. they can be you know fifteen twenty pounds, and um, they don't have a lot of guts like when you gut a pig or something. So right, yeah. it's almost all. It's almost all, and I've canned salmon too. And the nice thing yeah. about can, canning fish is you don't have to bone it. Yeah, after watching you uh, oh. can an entire deer, I'm I'm betting you can just about anything. <laughs> I can. Um, I've canned just about everything. In fact, I've in fact last time I canned water only because, and it sounds goofy, but when my canner's not completely full, the jars kind of float around, so mm-hmm. I stuck a thing of water in there and canned water and. Up here, we uh, we will get a snowstorm and lose power once in a while, so it's kind of nice to have. Well, now I have some sterilized water, I guess. Yeah, so. good idea. But that's what I'll do is I'll stick a jar of water. So I've canned everything, including water. <laughs> <laughs> you just love to can. Well, I, yeah, I've seen a little yeah. video you did on, on canning. You had a, a weighted pressure canner, and you was doing a little video on it. I thought that was neat. Yeah, I try to do videos here and there, although I always feel like um, I don't feel qualified, you know, because definitely ground meat is definitely not um, something that they would say is safe to do. Yeah. So, yeah. and I made sure I mentioned that in there because I don't want yeah, anybody catching me and then getting sick. But oh. um, you know, I we've never gotten sick off of it, and you know, and, and it's all cooked and stuff. So I don't. But I've canned a lot of we canned a lot of stuff when I started canning. I think I was about eight months pregnant, and I canned a bushel of tomatoes. <laughs> mm, yeah. with my mother-in-law and that was kind of my gateway drug for canning was was tomatoes and yeah um and now i can we probably have 700 jars that we've canned this wow. year yeah that's you're doing a whole but, lot more than i am that's for sure yeah but it's it's you know it's how we get our Around here, one of the one of the greatest blessings about where we live is it is a heavy it's a foodie mm-hmm. kind of a little mini foodie capital. So all the farms and but everything is fresh right now. Yeah. And the only way for me to get any of that is to buy it all at once, and I have to can it, and then mm-hmm. we have to wait till next year. So yeah. I'm kind of doing things how I guess our grandparents and great grandparents sure. did things. That's great. So right now we'll we basically will eat out of our out of that until next year this time and we'll you know we'll start it all over again wow you're doing some yeah you're doing some great stuff there well i don't want to tie you up all evening uh i'll just uh i'd like to know uh, where people can uh, check out all the stuff you're doing on and and maybe get in touch with you or just see your see your posts on facebook or whatever you have a facebook yeah, page i have think. A Facebook page called One Third Lot, and I, I did have a blog, but it, it just became really mm. difficult for me to find the time to update it, and part of it is I'm not incredibly tech savvy. They are a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, and it just it was really time consuming, and Facebook makes it so mm. easy. I take yeah. a picture with my smartphone, and it goes right on there, you know? Yep. So that's what I've done, and I'm not trying to make any money. I mean, a little, it would be nice someday to make some money, but... For me, it's more about education. And Mm -hmm. and my um, one-third lot page is more, you know, I focus on on, uh, heavily on food and and health. But Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I want people to know I'm not a doctor and don't proclaim to be one. Right. It's just my experiences. But I also have been been trying to start a 
more of a community page. So I have one third lot community, which is more like like your page. Like a group. Yeah. As a group, because I'd like to have more discussion. I'd like people to feel comfortable to. Yeah, that's what I find too. That, that, yeah, the fan pages are, are great for posting stuff, but yeah, you don't get a lot of interaction because Facebook limits <laughs> the, how many people see that. Yeah. So bad. So in the yeah. groups, uh, yeah, you definitely get a lot more interaction with the groups. That's why I started yeah, one. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get the group more active because uh, my heart is just to bless people and, mm-hmm. and help people. So. Yeah, you definitely done that in yeah, our group. I've I've noticed that uh, in the in the Homestead Front Porch group, you've definitely been there helping folks and giving good advice and and really reaching out and and being a helping hand in there. I appreciate that a lot. Oh well, thank you. And you know, and and like herbs are you know one of the things I focus on too because we have used herbs a lot as as medicine. Because with my daughter's heart problems, she mm-hmm. can't take um she can't take antihistamines, mm-hmm. and yet she has asthma. And she has um, very bad allergies, so we've used a lot of herbs to treat her her yeah. allergies and asthma. And you know, they've worked really well at keeping her out of um, the hospital. Because for her, an asthma attack means she takes her medication, and then we go to the hospital because of her heart problems. So, mm, yeah. Local so, local yeah. honey has been yeah. my uh, uh, rescuer around here when it comes to allergies. We've noticed that's really yeah. helped a lot. Is local honey. Yeah, we buy it from a local farm in five-gallon tubs. <laughs> mm, oh, wow. So, yeah, because we don't actually use sugar. We use honey or maple mm-hmm. syrup to cook with. Yeah, pretty expensive up there. It's pretty it. expensive around here, the local honey is. Well, if you buy it in small amounts, it is. Mm-hmm. We got ours. Uh, we get If you get it in a five-gallon tub, it's $135. Mm, okay. Which, mm. if you... Take that down to quart size jars, much more thrifty. Yeah, yeah. Than buying, yeah. Just the price of honey so, alone makes a person want to get into bees. I think. <laughs> I know. I would love to have bees. And then the other thing we use is maple syrup, which um, last year we didn't because my husband's father was was dying of Alzheimer's, but um, we didn't tap our trees. But we we have three maple trees, oh, and wow. our neighbor agreed to let us tap her trees. We did. Um, we actually did maple syrup, and we could. We actually did it over outside. We mm. rendered it, not rendered it, but we boiled it down Boil over it down, a yeah. rocket stove mm-hmm. that my husband made. So, but maple syrup up here is actually quite a bit more than honey for some reason. Really? Wow. Yeah. I tell you what, yeah. it should be more because it is a lot more work. I think to boil that down oh, and, and to, to it, reduce that down to the way you have to reduce it. I mean, it really can. It cuts it down a lot. <laughs> Oh, it's 40 to 1. Yeah. You just want to cry when you see how that water boils. <laughs> it, it amazes me that it isn't more expensive than what it is after that. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, but yeah, so my community page, I don't know if you can find it if you can't. I'll I, send yeah, you a I, link, think, I actually think I'm, I think I joined it actually. Uh, I, I will, I'll put okay. the links, I'll put the links in the, uh, in the show notes so other people can check it out and, uh, Join up and sign up for your fan page and your group, and uh, and also uh, you're always in the in the homestead front porch, uh, sharing information too. I so. am. <laughs> I'm well, glad I'm you're there. Waiting for kids to get out of work or whatever, I get on my phone and and look. So hopefully, some if anybody has any questions, they can even hit you up there. And I do hope they'll go and check out your yeah. page though, because you're loading some videos and things up in there that I think are are worth seeing and information and pictures and 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 i notice you, you do post a lot of uh health articles and things so that's always good i want you know that's great for people to stay to be, continue to be awakened to the to the real uh problems we have and and the solutions too. yeah and i try i try really hard to make sure that they're reputable mm-hmm. sources not just i mean a lot of times i'll yeah. post something and then in the comments i'll post articles from university studies and I'm I'm an avid reader and I read a lot of oh, medical medical stuff. So yeah, well, yeah. So people have something to take to their you know take to their doctor and talk to them about and ask questions. Mm-hmm. That's great. Because yeah. I'm all for people being their own medical advocate because sure doctors just get busy and they don't have time to to think about stuff. But if you ask them, they're usually really willing to talk about it with you. Yeah. Right. Yeah, well, you're doing some great stuff there, and I, I hope you continue to. Well, I know you will. You're going to continue to keep doing it, and it's where your heart's at. And uh, I'm I'm excited about what you're doing, and and I hope you get to teaching more classes and and, and spreading the word up your way. And uh, I actually do hope that uh, you can get a community growing a little bit more, even and start doing even more stuff online for those who can't uh, 
you know, get to learn locally from you. Uh, maybe you can uh, share a lot of your uh, knowledge uh, online, and uh, there's a lot of people that really benefit from that these days, and I'm glad. I tell you what, I sometimes I hate technology, but I also see where it, the, the learning that's available through technology, and I really appreciate that. And uh, so, I mean, there's so many things yeah. I've learned online, you know, uh, just seeing people do it, or even YouTube, watching YouTube videos and things. I've learned how to do more oh, things man. from YouTube than just about anywhere else. Oh, my goodness. I know my kids, too. We actually don't have television, mm. so we, we call it YouTube you know, we, I'm telling you, we watch more YouTube videos. <laughs> My kids have learned to play the piano and the guitar. I mean, and I go on there all the time and watch. YouTube is an amazing thing. If yeah, I have a question, a I go on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the first place I go to. If I'm trying to figure out how to do something, it's the first place I go and just try to, because it's so nice to be able to watch somebody do it and, and, and learn. So. Yeah. That's- yeah. It's a lot easier to watch somebody do something than read. And that's one of the things I'm realizing and working harder about doing some some videos. Yeah, that's great. But, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm not real good with videos either. I wish I could do more of them. But I find they're pretty time-consuming for me because I'm trying to do something and to, to try to film it while you're doing it just takes twice as long. And, <laughs> you know, it, it is time-consuming. Exactly. Consuming. But, but the benefit you to other people. need a third arm. <laughs> great. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we're just a, some, or just a producer and a director and a few other people to <laughs> take care of that for you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Or a drone or, you know, yeah, GoPro, there you go. which is expensive. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, uh, Rachel, it's been great talking to you. I'm going to let you go and uh, and you just keep up the great work and we'll get everything up in the show notes. And uh, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and being with me today. Thank you for having me. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. I know I sure did. Uh, Rachel's just, uh, she sounds like she's got a lot going on up there in her little homestead. And I, I just, I love her heart for wanting to help people and uh, teach them homesteading and and canning and food preservation and food preparation. And uh, I think she's got a lot to offer. So I hope you'll go over and check out her page at One Third Lot. I'll put uh, the links to her fan page and her uh, community group in the show notes. So you need to go check that out and join up. I don't think she's been doing that a long time, uh, but she's been posting a lot of... uh, a lot of great stuff in there. She posts a lot of uh, health articles, and and even, I've seen her even put a few videos on there of her canning and and doing some other stuff. Uh, she had some on there the other day of um, sprouting, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, but go check that out. You can also uh, get a hold of her in the uh, Homestead Front Porch Facebook group. That is the Facebook group of the Modern Homesteading Podcast, and uh, it is a closed group. But all you got to do to join is ask. So just search in Facebook for Homestead Front Porch, and we'll get you on in there. Also, we really appreciate you listening, but we also appreciate it when you leave us an iTunes review. So if you don't mind, if you don't mind, you can even see a, in the show notes there'll be a link at the bottom if you don't know how to leave a review, where you can uh, it shows you kind of step by step what you got to do to leave a, a review in iTunes. And listen, we're not, it's not all about vanity and just seeing how many people like us. Although we do like hearing from people and, and hearing that they appreciate the show, but it really is about helping other people find the show and, and convincing them to listen as well because we think homesteading is worth doing. And as you heard Rachel say, uh, the few changes she's made in her life, living a homestead lifestyle, have made a world of difference to her health. And uh, we feel like that, that can happen for a lot of people. It happened for me as well. And uh, I think it's important. You know, I think it's a better way to live. I think it's a way healthier way to live. And I think it also does a lot uh, to exercise our freedoms and our liberties. Um, it really gives us back some control in our lives. So we feel like homesteading is worth doing. So, yeah, uh, definitely uh, do that if you can. Leave us an iTunes review. You can also read some of the other articles and find the other podcasts at uh, smalltownhomestead.com. We'll hope you go there and check out some of the articles and and stuff we've written. And until next week, uh, happy homesteading and uh, God bless. Thanks for listening. To see the show notes for this podcast or listen to other podcast episodes, go to smalltownhomestead.com. There you can also read our blog, connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+, and take advantage of the many resources we make available to help you along in your homesteading journey. Please share this podcast and help us to carry out our mission of helping others to homestead today for a better tomorrow.